My God is amazing, isn't he? Yes. He knows each one by name. He knows the stars. He knows everything. He keeps us all together for us. Thank you, Jesus, for this great for me. Thank you for that. Amen. We'd like to say a special prayer for Jason. He might be suffering in some way. We pray that the Lord touches his heart. Thank you, Lord. He's the one that passed on to be with the Lord, hopefully. We hopefully he found salvation, Lord. We're grateful that uh, the Lord always forgives and loves us unconditionally. Amen? Amen. We pray for that. And we have some birthdays this morning. Oh, yeah. We got Jeremiah and Joshua, and that's a good you don't want to pay over 20. You don't want to stay off the couch. You don't want to stay off the Never ask a woman to raise you. You do. Make sure it's always under, not over. Yeah. All right. How's everybody doing this morning, all right? Well, it's good to see the church. It looks beautiful out there. Please continue to support it. We still got a long way to go. We have the electrician here. We got the, the, um, the lights out there on sensors. They come on at night to keep the church protected. And we got more to do in the front. We got a lot of work to do in the hallway as we rebuild her and bring her back to her former glory. And then some. So please continue to support the building fund. We're grateful for that. All right, we're going to turn to Jeremiah chapter 29 this morning. I'm going to start there. As always, the Holy Spirit will be taken over as I read these scriptures to you. So please clear your minds and prepare your hearts to receive the message of the Spirit. Let's try to say the church this morning. Amen? Amen. Okay. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, she got us in verse 10. Let's see what we got here. All right. Let's start in verse 10. I'll stay on. I'll stay on. There is a, there's a blue card in the pew if you need help to get to the scriptures that will help you. As we will be going through a lot of scriptures this morning. <coughs> Jeremiah 29 verse 10. Give me a second to get there. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon. For 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised and will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. How about a big amen there? The Lord has a plan for each and every one of us. And it's not for bad, but it's for good. Not for disaster, but for, for blessing. And if you follow him wholeheartedly, he promises that you will find him. And he will take over your life, and he will change your life. And he will make you more like Jesus each and every day. How about you amen there? Not our power, and his power. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection. We're grateful. All right, this morning, uh, we're going to take a little detour from what we've been preaching on of the Holy Spirit, because God has been writing on my heart to share this message of God's unconditional love. Amen. We all need that. We all need to understand it and how powerful it really is. So I want to start off this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. chapter 13, verse 1, okay? When I get to the fourth verse, okay, as a family, we're going to recite this together. Can I get an amen here? Amen. We're going to really understand God's love as a church and as a family. All right, verse 1. Love is the greatest. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans, and possess all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Okay, you ready? Yep. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. I'm going to begin to the Lord. That's the kind of love that the Lord has put in each of our hearts. We have that, we possess it. The moment we believe in Jesus, He puts that into our hearts. The problem is, we have another heart. It's called the heart of flesh. That's conditional. We have conditional love in our human heart. But in our spiritual heart, when you tell somebody you love them, it's the same love that God loves. I'm a big amen there. And He gives us the desire and the power to carry that out. Now I'm just going to read on a little bit more. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. But love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. Even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things that will last forever. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. I'm going to be in there. And we're going to speak of that this morning, of God's unconditional love, because we can read the Bible, study the Bible, but if it doesn't bring us to a heart of love, we would have accomplished nothing. It's not designed to make us a scholar. It's not designed to make us smarter. It's designed to make us like Jesus, full of love and compassion and empathy for others. How about a big amen there? Amen. One thing we never want to get in our church is spiritually prideful. We want to always remain humble and of service to others, just like Jesus is for us. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to explain it because unconditional love this morning because maybe we don't really fully grasp it. So I have a hard time grasping that unconditional love because we live in a world that is full of conditions. But to understand God's unconditional love, we don't have to work for that. And that's a blessing. A lot of times our flesh gets in the way of our spirit and we think we can serve God in our flesh and all we end up is frustrated and giving up because we can't. So what makes love unconditional? The definition of unconditional love is without restrictions or limits, unquestioning. How can you be certain of unconditional love and where you can find it? There is one true source of this kind of love, and it's God. If we want to learn to love others unconditionally, listen now, we must look to God who is the perfect source. I didn't know what unconditional love was until I met Jesus. Amen. Okay, I knew of God, but I didn't know God personally through Jesus Christ. Once I got to understand that, I start to really understand how much God really loves me. If I'm honest, I may never fully understand how God can still love me, even when I do things that sever our relationship at times. We all know that, right? Yet, Jesus allows us to experience the love of the Father through His death. Do you want to love people unconditionally? Here are some things that you should know about unconditional love. Okay, the first principle. Is everybody with me so far? All right. God never runs out of unconditional love. 
God's love is infinite. Thank you, Jesus. Think about it. There will never be a day when God doesn't love you. Remember that. You can't do or say anything to revoke God's love. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Okay? The problem is, in our finite world, we get rejected by our friends. Our marriages sometimes end in divorce. And our parents don't support us the way we desire. Is there any wonder we don't fully understand God's love for us? But by working on our relationship with God, reaching out to Him, reading His Word, and trusting Him for everything, we can begin to know an unconditional love we have not known or might ever know again. I've got a big amen there. All right, go read Romans chapter 8. We're going to start there this morning. We are going to be going to the scriptures to back up all these claims of God's unconditional love. The one beautiful thing about God is He loves us unconditionally, and you can't improve on that love. It's a one-time event. He sees us like He sees His Son the moment we believe. The next thing He starts to do, He starts perfecting us. Perfection in the Bible is maturing us. He starts to make us more like Jesus by walking in the Spirit and crucifying our flesh. And that's the process of sanctification. Okay? Our salvation is locked in. The moment we believe, it's, it's locked in. Our position is correct. That vertical, uh, us and Jesus are good forever. It's this part. We need to make our, our, our position, like our condition has to be like our position. So we have to become more like him this way. He does that through relationships, people, places, and things. He makes us more like Jesus. Can I get an amen here? Amen. Okay, so we understand that. It's locked in. You can't get out of his hand. Once you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you're, you're saved to the day of redemption. You cannot get unsaved. I'm a big amen there. Amen. Once you believe, you're in. But then the Holy Spirit starts working on us. Now, if you want to continue to sin, you can try, but you're going to get the consequences, and you're going to get the conviction, and you're going to get the chastening hand of God, which is a good thing. Conviction is good for us. It helps us understand that the things of the flesh no longer appeal to us anymore. We'd rather do things in the Spirit, and we start to dislike the things we used to do in the flesh. Can I get any amen here? We might fail at times, and we will, but our goal is to what? Not do it anymore. But it's so ingrained in us, sin is like a virus, Paul says. It lays dormant inside of us, waits for a weak spot, and then it pops up into our ugly hearts. It shows up again at times when we wish that it wouldn't. All right, Romans 8.31. Look what it says. Verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. He's our advocate. Big, big amen there. Can any, go to verse 35 now. Now this is not a feeling. This is a fact. Understand. Go way beyond your emotions here and understand. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. Psalms 44 verse 22. No. The Bible is a big no here. Despite all these things, Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. The victory is in Christ. We already have the victory. It's not an emotion. Can I give me many here? We have the victory. Now the devil's going to try to make me not think that or feel that. Mm. And I am convinced. Now I hope you are convinced. In verse 38, Paul was convinced. Now you have to be convinced. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Mm. Neither death nor life, neither angels, nor demons, nor rulers, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell 
can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I'll put a big amen there. Amen. And that is a fact. Now when it says revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord, it's meaning it's revealed in the Word of God. I put a big amen in there. Amen. Okay. The second one. Unconditional love makes sacrifices. Listen now. Perhaps the most well-known verse is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. We understand that. God's love is so far-reaching that he sacrificed his own son to pay the penalty for our sin and bridge the gap between sinners and a holy God. God has already made the ultimate sacrifice for us. If we want to love this way, we need to make sacrifices too. Sometimes it means we must sacrifice our comfort, our time, or other resources to love others. With no strings attached, we can reap the benefits of all that unconditional love has to offer. Go with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, we're going to look at verse 12. Why? Because of all that he has done for you. 
when you understand that everything God has done for you, you have no problem giving yourself to Him. How do you understand everything He's done for you? By reading His Word from Genesis to Revelation. You understand the whole scope of His character and His love for you and what He's actually done for you. And what He continues to do for you. Now it says, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. Now, is a sacrifice good? You want to put money in the basket? Sure, yeah. But he's looking for your heart. He's looking for your heart. To love others unconditionally, to love your enemies. It's easy to love those who love you. He says, but I want you to go beyond that and love people that don't love you. That's the love of God in your heart. Now listen up. Look at verse 2. Oh, this is no, this is your truly way to worship him. Verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. See what it says when I repeat that? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Now what do I do instead of that? But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. What, 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 what is he going to do? Our minds have to get renewed. We have to start changing. The only thing that transforms us is the Word of God. Changing the way we think. We start to see things in a different perspective. The world doesn't change. People don't change. We change. We start to see things in a spiritual view. We start to see others that are hurting other people because they've been hurt. We know that we hurt other people because we've been hurt. We start to see things with empathy and compassion, with the spirit instead of the flesh. And then he went here. We start to understand that God's putting these people in front of us to transform us and change us. There is no growth in the Christian life without resistance. Like I said before, you go to the gym, sit at the machine, but never use the machine. Well, your muscles grow, no, you come to church, read your Bible, but never apply it or put it into practice. Do you really think that you're going to grow spiritually? It does not happen until you start to apply what you're learning. Can I get a big amen here? Yeah. It has to be applied. Now, first you have to learn it, renew your mind, and then what? Use it and put it into practice. If you want to get good at anything, you have to practice it. That's not rocket science. Now what it says. You change the way you think. Then you will know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect or mature. All right, the third principle. You don't have to earn unconditional love. It's, you already have it. It's a gift. The gift of unconditional love is free. With no strings attached. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to prove it. So if you have unconditional love, doesn't it make sense that you should be able to give it if you have it? If you have unconditional love, doesn't it make sense to actually use it? You're a Christian, you're supposed to be different. To act different, to show people something different. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. This is a familiar verse, but we're not going to leave out verse 10. <laughs> God saved you by His grace when you started to come to church. <laughs> oh, that's not anything. God saved you by His grace when you started being good. No, that's not in there either. He saved you by His grace when you believed it. Okay, that's what saves you. You believe it. And you can't take any credit for it. It is a gift from God. Verse 9, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Oh, well let's read what it says after that. Look at verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. Do you imagine God's calling you his masterpiece? You look at him and say, me a masterpiece? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. He says, we are God's masterpiece. That's not an emotion, it's a fact. Now look what it says. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, or in the Word of God. Why? 
so we can do the good things that He planned for us long ago. Our flesh and our sin nature prevented us from doing God's will. Now that He saved you, He gave us the ability, He gave us a new heart and a new mind, so we can do the things that God planned to do in us long ago. Not that we planned, but He planned. Are you amen yet? Before we were saved, it was our plan. And what we wanted out of life. The gift of salvation is changing from our plan to His plan. Saying, all right, Lord, use me. Amen. That's salvation. This is an extraordinary concept to consider. Jesus' death on the cross already paid for our salvation. Thank you, Jesus, right? By taking on the penalty for sin, he made it possible for God to offer his unconditional love to us. In America today, however, it is common to believe that everything, including love, must be earned. Mm. <laughs> Yet following Christ means God's love comes free of charge. Still, for most of my life, I've always tried to earn it. Mm -hmm. Always tried to earn it. I felt like if I just completed a certain task, read my Bible, or prayed a certain way, I could be on God's good side. Anybody agree with me on that? Mm -hmm. We know what we're talking about. Our flesh wants to please Him, right? <laughs> but Christ's death erased all that. It erased it all. Although Bible reading and prayer are important, don't get me wrong, it's very important, there is no required amount that I have to do to earn more of God's love. He already loves us completely. Yeah. You, don't have, you don't have to get any more. You have it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. How about the big amen there? Yeah. You can't get any more love out of him. It's already complete. But we try to get points with God. I'm going to be better today. I'm going to do penance. I was bad last week, so I'm going to go to the church more and help clean. Or what I want to do to make it up. You can't make up. You can't make it up. It's already paid for in full. That's like saying Jesus didn't do enough on the cross for you. You have to go and do more for him. Can I get a big amen there? Amen. You can't. You, there's no such thing as penance. Look, you already paid the debt in full. You don't have to go back and pay it again. You do it because you are saved, not to stay saved. How about a big amen there? Amen. It's a different perspective. That's all it is. It's a different motive. You do it because you want to do it, not because you have to do it. There's a new desire that God plants in the believer's heart. Now, you always have the old heart saying, no, we're too busy. But that new heart is always there, ready to say, yeah, use me, Lord. Mm -hmm. What gets in the way? Me too, our flesh. Mm -hmm. I got to get my stuff done first. We're reading you know, in the Bible right now about rebuilding God's temple. Everybody stopped building it and started building their own houses instead. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. And he said, well, you're building your house over mine. And he said, no, build my house first and your house will fall right into place. I got to name that again. And that's what we're doing here, right? We're rebuilding his house. And I'll tell you what, nothing brings more joy to my heart than to see this come to glory again. And to see them shoes get filled. Amen. Nothing brings more joy. Amen. No selfish thing that I want to do can ever fulfill what this fulfills in me. Amen. I'll put a big amen there. Amen. Okay. The fourth principle, you just have to accept it. It's all you have to do. It's a gift. Do you accept that gift today, my brothers and sisters? It's an unconditional gift. It's just a gift to say yes. And he's going to what? work inside of you. There's no certain time frame. Like everybody's in a different place. That's why we need a lot of room, a lot of grace, a lot of mercy to grow. We get to give us such a lot of room to grow. We're stubborn. We let down will sometimes over God. But he touches us all the time. He's so gentle with me, God. I'll tell you. He's so gentle with me. A lot of times I want to do things my way. He says, no, John. Look at, the, look at the result of doing things your way. And he makes me think twice about it. I say, you know what? You're right. I'm not going to do it that way today. I'm going to do it his way. I'm going to put it to the test. I'm going to go by the owner's manual today. And when you start to do that, you start to see it working. When you actually put it into action. All right, now I'm going to talk about the woman at the well. Remember the woman at the well? Wait, you just have to accept it. The woman at the well was looking for love in all the wrong places. After several husbands, mm -hmm. and then being with someone else, she was tired. 
Lot had hung her rope to dry until she met Jesus. Amen. Go with me to John chapter 4. It's the same with us in the world today. We're looking for love. People that love us, we want to be loved by people. Let me tell you something. There'll be no more greater love than the love of Jesus in your life. Look what it says in John chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus answered her. John chapter 4, look at verse 13. Jesus replied, drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. You know what it is right? You drink a bottle of water, you wish you not to drink anymore, but you have to drink another bottle. You're never, never satisfied. You're always going to quench that thirst. That's what he's saying. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. And what's the water he's talking about? It's the water of the Word of God. Will never be thirsty again. What? It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them giving them eternal life, which is spiritual life. Okay? That's what it says, right? It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Look what she said in verse 15. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, that I will never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. How about a big amen there? He's saying, if you find Jesus, the word of life, and you let him water your spirit, you will not be reaching for love in the wrong places. You have the love of God that's fulfilling you. That's the holy put in every one of us. That hole in every believer's heart is for him, not for anybody else. Sure, it's all right to have somebody in your life, but that is not the fulfillment because if that was the case, nobody would commit adultery, nobody would cheat on their wife, nobody would be looking at other places after they get it. Because it still doesn't satisfy them. But when you find Jesus... In the word of life, and you use the Bible as own as manual, you're complete. One woman is enough. Your wife is a precious pearl. You don't need anything else. You don't go after anything else because you don't need it, and you don't do anything to what? Destroy it. Can I get a big amen here? That's when the Spirit leads you. The flesh is never satisfied. Never. As long as you're in the flesh, you'll always be hungry for something else. So the Bible is designed to crucify your flesh. That's because when you want your flesh to get satisfied, the Bible don't do it. Because the Bible isn't designed to gratify your flesh. It's, it's designed to kill it. And gratify your spirit. But if you still want your flesh, the Bible will become a stench to you. Yeah, I don't want to read the Bible. I want to find I want somebody, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go look somewhere else. Instead of waiting for the Lord to put someone into your life. Then when you're ready. So we go look for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> when there's only one place to look. The Word of God. And then He'll put someone in your life when He sees the time is right. You, you're faithful to Him, He'll be faithful to you. How about a big amen there? Okay. When Jesus offered her the living water of salvation, the woman's life was changed. It was changed. This one shy, intimidated woman was proclaiming from the rooftop what Jesus had done for her. We don't have to settle for subpar relationships trying to fill the void within our souls. Jesus has already offered us the living water of salvation. Amen. We all have to, all we have to do is drink it. Is that accepted? I'm going to dig in there. Amen. All right, five, you can never lose unconditional love. Thank you, Lord. How many times does the devil make us feel like the Lord can't be happy with me? Yeah. Oh, I've been out of his will for so long. He must not want me. And the devil gets in your ears and you think that you're saved. Look at you. Look what you're doing. Look what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with my performance to get saved. It had everything to do with my faith and what I believe. So you can tell the devil to take a hike. I'm not buying into it. Although I might be falling, he's got his hands around me and he's going to bring me back. He's going to get me back again. And I'm never going to lose faith in him. You got a problem with that? Read the book of Job. We're doing a study on that. 
Although he went through all that turmoil, he never lost his faith in God. He might have complained and doubted his salvation at one point, but he never left his faith in God. He only stuck with him all the way through. And what did God do at the end? He blessed him double. How about a big amen in there? Amen. Don't ever give up. You can never lose on in the story of the lost son, the prodigal, both the prodigal son and the eldest son are lost in different ways. Okay? The eldest brother can't understand why his younger brother is getting celebrated for his repentance, while he, the eldest, does the right thing by taking care of his father and is not rewarded. So it's a double thing here. Go over to Luke chapter 15. Does everybody want me so far on this? Don't worry, God's never going to give up on you. You're going to give up on you before he does. Don't give up. Don't give up on others either. Keep praying for people. Keep praying. Never give up praying for people, family members, that you think their eyes are closed. Keep praying for them that God will what? Open their eyes like he opened yours. Just keep praying. Never give up. I thank God that my mother never gave up on me. Because one day he answered it. And here I am. It's incredible. I can't, I can't even fathom how I can be up here. But he answered it. He took me out of the pit. And put me into the pulpit. Only he could do that. I was on a path of self-destruction and no return. Until he touched my life. And he changed me completely. It's amazing. That's why if I didn't think this would work, I wouldn't preach it. I wouldn't be up here. It works because it did it for me. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. But you have to have faith, you have to have patience, and you have to have perseverance, and he will line it up for you if you trust him. Just get out of the way and let him do it. Every time you try to help him, you won't even hinder your progress. Let him help you. He's teaching you to be patient. How many impatient people in the room today? Yeah, I know we could all raise our hands. Right? <laughs> in some areas we're patient, some patient, some places we have no patience. We're all different. It's diverse. Now let's read this account. Look at verse 29 of Luke, Luke chapter 15. This is the brother. Luke 15, verse 29. But he replied, All these years I slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Now he's all aggravated. He said, I never left you. You never gave me a party. <laughs> you, lost, you had everything already. Listen. Look at it. Look at it said. Now listen. Yet we just find in this story an unconditional love that seems unbelievable. Listen, look at verse 31. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We have to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. What does the Bible say? We rejoice when a sinner repents and comes back. We that stay here, we're good, but we pray for them to come back, and when they come back, you don't beat them up the same way you've been. Say, welcome home. The Father's hands are open. Welcome home. There's good Pharisees that go to church all the time and get mad. What are you doing glorifying them? I've been here all along. Why was my reward? You already got your reward. You're being able, your ability to stay. Believe me. For them to come back is a great reward. To get a sinner to come back again. It's an honor. 
And we said, well, come home. That's what this church is going to practice. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. We're not going to be a bunch of Pharisees here. If somebody walked through that door and it's written, we welcome them home. Yes. We don't ask them where they've been. We already know where they've been. The devil had a field day with them. But now they're broken. God broke them enough to bring them back. And through the brokenness, they find, they rekindle their love with the Lord again. And they might find salvation that they never had. Because the blessing is through the brokenness. Amen. People who aren't sick don't need a doctor, the Bible says. If we could admit that we're sick and we need a Savior, Jesus is all over us. But if we don't think we're sick, then why do we think we need a Savior? All of us are sick. We're all born into sin. We all need a Savior. What did he say to Mary Madeline? Why does she love you so much, Lord? He said she loves much because she's been forgiven much. Amen. Those who haven't, don't love much, haven't been forgiven much. That's why I'm so passionate how much I love the Lord. Because he's forgiven me. All the right and nasty things in the place I've been with all my life, he forgave me and put me up here. I can't do nothing but honor him for the rest of my life. Because I was dead. I was lost. <clears throat> But now I'm found. Amen. It's amazing. And he can do it for you. You just have to let him do it. Amen. The problem is, we all get in the way of him changing us. Because change is not easy. And if you don't need to change, then you don't need a savior. We all need to change. And he does it in different ways and different process. Can I get amen here? Amen. All of us need to change. If we didn't need to change, we wouldn't need Jesus. Thank you. Now, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. No matter how bad you believe, you have messed up your life. Amen. Okay? With the heart of repentance, you can always come back to the Father. He will greet you with a kiss and invite you to a party throw in your arm. How about a big amen there? Okay, the sixth principle. We're going to have to close here. We'll keep it a little bit longer. To be like Christ... To be like Jesus, you have to love unconditionally. That is what Christ's likeness is. To love unconditionally. But this is easier said than done. Can I get an amen here? Amen. It's easier said than done. It's easy to love those that are easy to love. But how difficult is it when God asks you to love someone who is annoying <laughs> and mistreats you over and over again? Love is an action, not an emotion. It takes practice, my brothers and sisters. It takes practice. There's no growth without resistance. You have to have unlovable people around you to practice unconditional love. So don't try to shoo them away. Thank God that He put them there to change you. Most people want to get out of there. Oh, get the people away from me. I want all good people in my life. There is no good people. <laughs> what Bible are you reading? There is no good people. Now listen. It takes practice. It's not just a feeling that's here today and gone tomorrow. It takes work, okay, to maintain and means knowing who Jesus is so you can love others like he did. Okay? It takes communication, sacrifice, and commitment to be more like Him. Praying, listening, journaling, and attending church regularly in Bible studies are just some of the ways you can practice nurturing your relationship with God so you can nurture your relationship with others too. See, once you get your relationship right with God, you can love others unconditionally too because you know God loves you unconditionally. So when you develop that relationship first, all the others fall into place. That's why he said, seek the kingdom above everything else, and all these things will fall into place for you. Because once you get that relationship down, you and God, that unconditional relationship, you can have beautiful relationships with people. Leaving them where they are and let the Holy Spirit work in them and accepting them where they are and not to expect anything from them. Amen. Unrealistic expectations. Can I get an amen here? We expect other people to be like us. No. No, we don't need any clones here. We don't need clones. We need people to come to Jesus, not to us. We're not saviors. We're not Jesus. We don't want people to be like us. Trust me, we want people to be like Jesus. 
And the only way that's going to happen if they see it for what? Think amen, man. Right? Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. We're going to close here. If it wasn't for God's unconditional love, I wouldn't be able to keep doing this. Because I fail. I'm a sinner. Look at Matthew 5, look at verse 43. You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's Leviticus 43, 19 and 18. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. See, true children. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're kind to only your friends, how are you different from anybody else? What's the difference? Even pagans do that. But you ought to be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, what's perfect in the Bible? Mature. You have to be mature to love unconditionally like God does. And that can only be accomplished in the Spirit. There's no way you can love somebody unconditionally in the flesh that's hating on you. Can I get a big amen there? Alright, we're going to have to stop here. They ain't me shit. I'm going to pick up one more message on this drunk additional month when we get back together. I'm going to call the usher to come up and take up the collection. Thank you for letting me shit out.